our Bibles now to the book of Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 22. Now, uh, let's turn over here in our Bibles, and it's the Gospel of Matthew, and it's Matthew chapter 22. And uh, we want to read the Word of God here uh, this morning. Now, in Matthew 22 and verses 17 and following. Now, turn over there. Of course, we know where the Gospel of Matthew is, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Uh, Matthew chapter 22, and we want to read verses 17 uh, through 21. Tell us, therefore... seated, and uh, uh, what we have here is this familiar passage in the Word of God uh, that we have in the ministry and the life of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we um, uh, study the Word of God here, we see a tremendous principle in the Word of God, and the principle is very, very simple in the Word of God. See, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That means that as Christians, we ought to pay our taxes. I've known uh, two Christians, and they said they're born again, they love the Lord, and they said we, uh, we don't have to pay taxes. We should not pay taxes. Well, uh, the one fella is in jail. He actually went to jail, and the other fellow went bankrupt. So uh, uh, don't let anybody tell you, uh, as a Christian, we're not to pay our taxes. Say, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. We see that uh, very clearly in the Word of God. But uh, the portion that many times is overlooked, it says, render unto God the things that are God's. In other words, there is a portion of our money that is God's, and it belongs to God. Now, the word render means to give. We're to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but then we are to give to God that which is God's, you see, and uh, that is very clear in the Word of God. See, a portion of all of our money belongs to God. It is God's money. Render unto God. Give unto God the things that are uh, uh, God's. Now, what we want to do this morning is deal with a subject that uh, is uh, unheard of in our churches and Christian circles. Now, there's nobody here probably has ever heard a message like you're going to hear this morning from the Word of God because nobody teaches this. It's unheard of in our uh, Bible colleges and in our uh, associations and so, uh, so forth. Now, what we want to uh, deal with, what does the Bible really teach about giving? and our money. What does the Bible, now not what does Pastor Gent say about it, but what does the Bible say about it? Now, as we study the Word of God, again, I believe the Bible is very, very clear. Most people have never studied the Word of God in relation to this subject because they're afraid to study the Word of God in relation to this subject. Now, first of all, let's begin in the Old Testament. And then we'll come to the New Testament and study the Word of God and get a hold of uh, uh, what the Bible teaches in relation to this matter. Now, in Genesis chapter 14 and in verse 20, we read there about Abraham and we read about Melchizedek. Now, most everybody is agreed that uh, Abraham, obviously, even as we study the New Testament, is a type of the believer, our father Abraham. Now, and Melchizedek uh, certainly is a type of the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Now, the Bible says that Abraham gave Melchizedek the tithes of all. See, actually in uh, Genesis 14 and verse 20, and he gave him tithes of all. Now, see, that was way back in Genesis chapter 14 in the Bible. Now, the law had not been given. 
Moses didn't come on the scene until 430 years later. But yet you have someone way back before the law was ever given, a man by the name of Abraham giving tithes unto Melchizedek. And Abraham is a type of the believer. Melchizedek is a type of uh, the Lord Jesus uh, Christ. Then you come to Genesis chapter 28 and in verse 22, and you read there about a man in the Bible, and we read there about Jacob in the Bible. And we find that, that, I believe that was Jacob's conversion, and that's when Jacob really got right with God. You read about it in Genesis chapter uh, 28, and in Genesis 28 and 22, he said, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So now here, 430 years before Moses, before the law was given, you have two men that tithed uh, unto the Lord. You had Abraham and you had Jacob. Now, the question uh, is asked, well, why did they tithe? Now, because up until this time in the Bible, uh, there is no command of God for them to tithe. Now, the obvious and clear answer to that question is that, see, God revealed it to Abraham and the Jacob that they were to tithe. And so way back in the beginning of the Bible, now keep in mind, this is before the law of Moses. This is in the beginning, uh, Genesis chapter 14 in the book of um, uh, uh, Genesis. And then uh, turn in your Bible now to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Now in Leviticus chapter uh, 27, that's the last chapter in the book of uh, Leviticus. Now, in the last chapter in the book of Leviticus and in verse 30, now this is under the law. This is the law of Moses. Now, um, in uh, Leviticus 27 and verse 30, and all the tithe. See, it's very interesting when you read about that in the Old Testament. Say, all the tithe, not some of the tithe, all the tithe. This is Leviticus chapter 20. Uh, 7 and verse 30, and all the tithes of the land, say, and all, all the tithes of the land, say, uh, whether it, uh, of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree is the Lord's, it is holy unto the Lord. Now, so there the Bible teaches that under the law, the tithe was holy unto the Lord, and the tithe belonged to the Lord. It was not the Israelites. It was uh, the Lord, Lord's. And then in verse 34 of Leviticus 27, these are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of uh, Israel in Mount uh, Sinai. So there's no question about it under the law now. Now, see, we went before the law. Now, during the law, uh, a tithe was the Lord's and it was holy unto the Lord's. It was sanctified unto the Lord's. It was not the people's money, it was God's money. Now you turn to the last book, and we were there last Sunday morning. In the last book in the Old Testament, we have the book of Malachi, and it is also the last book chronologically uh, uh, speaking right at the end of the Old Testament. And then in Malachi chapter uh, 3, and uh, the Bible says here in verse 8, see, will a man rob God? And then uh, Malachi 3 and verse 8, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? Say, in tithes and offerings. Say, you, you robbed me. Now, that's God speaking. That's not Malachi speaking. And uh, the Bible says there, you're robbing God if they did not tithe. And then... Um, but ye say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. See, and we sang about it this morning, verse 10. Bring ye all, not some, all the tithes into the storehouse, you see. And so there's no question about it as we study the Old Testament, what the Old Testament uh, teaches us about the matter of giving. Now, way, way under hundreds of years before the law was given, say tithing was in existence with Abraham and uh, Jacob. Then during the law, 
the Bible. Actually, you have uh, uh, three different tithes in the Old Testament. We'll not go into that, but uh, uh, there was a, a two tithes and then a, a third tithe for the poor. But there were tithes and offerings in the Old Testament. And so you, you had a, a lot of offerings, a lot of tithes. You had the first fruits of the land. When the farmer would go out and get the, uh, agri in the agricultural society, he'd get the fruit of the land. He would, first of all, give the first fruits unto uh, God. We read about thank offerings in the Old Testament when uh, God would bless somebody or they wanted to give a thank offering uh, uh, to God. They wanted to thank God, they would bring a, 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 a special offering to the Old Testament uh, a tabernacle. So there's no question about what the Old Testament teaches about giving. And there's where we get into the matter of tithes and where God says bring all the tithes into uh, the storehouse. Now, as we come to uh, the New Testament, now, uh, turn in your Bible, just a, a book over to Matthew chapter 23 and verse 23. Now, now, here Jesus is speaking to a bunch of hypocrites. Now, uh, these were people who didn't know the Lord. They were not saved. They were leading others astray. Now, in Matthew 23 and verse 23, he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. By the way, that word woe, that's a strong word given from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. And he says, you're hypocrites. Sometimes people think that Jesus was the meek and mild uh, Jesus. Well, here he pointed his finger right in somebody's face and he said, you are hypocrites. Yes, you, the people I'm pointing at, the people I'm talking to, you're a bunch of hypocrites. So we see that here in the word of God. And he says, and this is the reason why they were hypocrites. He says, for ye pay tithe of the mint and anise and cumin. Uh, and they were the smallest of the seeds. Now, how anybody could get those small seeds and plant them or divide them up is beyond me. You need a magnifying glass. These are the smallest of the small seeds. Sometimes you get some seeds, you go plant them in the garden. Uh, some are big and you can see them. And then sometimes you get these seeds, you're just planting something, a uh, flower seed or something, and they're so small, you, you can't even uh, see them. See, and they, these were the uh, minuscule seeds that he mentions here. But he says, ye have omitted the weightier matters of the law. In other words, the more important things, the matter of justice and mercy and faith. See, uh, you didn't pay any attention to the major teaching of the Old Testament law. But this, uh, then he goes on and he says here in verse 23, these ought ye to have done. Now, in other words, what he's saying here, say you were right in one area of your life, even though you're hypocrites, even though you don't do right and so forth. In this area of your life, you were doing right. You were obeying the word of God in the matter of tithing. And even though you're a hypocrite, that's one area that you can be commended in that you are um, tithing. And then he says, but you ought not to have left the other undone. The problem is the most important things, the things that are uh, more important, you left out. There's no justice or righteousness with you uh, or anything like that. You're not really teaching even uh, the word of God. So what you see there in the Gospels, of course, Jesus was under the law until Calvary. And that's where the veil of the temple was rent in two when Jesus died on the cross of uh, Calvary. But now under, he's under the law, but see, he commends tithing. And he even commends the hypocrites for tithing. So that's an interesting passage in the Word of God. Now, as you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, now he's talking about the church. Now we're in the church age, you see. And... Um, now, this has to do with the local uh, churches. Now, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he's writing to the church at Corinth. See, the book of Corinthians, the church at Corinth. In fact, turn back to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth. See, was in the city of Corinth. See, is not talking about a universal church. 
He's not talking about an invisible church. He's talking about the church in the city of Corinth. Now, in chapter 9 and, uh, of 1 Corinthians and verse uh, 13, chapter 9 and verse 13, he says, Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Now, very interesting principle that Paul is talking about here. And he says, you know, with your background um, in the, the Old Testament scriptures and uh, so forth, you know that uh, this principle was in effect in the Old Testament, that uh, they which minister about holy things um, of the temple, you see, and how were the priests supported in the Old Testament? See, the priests in the Old Testament were supported by the tithes of God's children. That is how they were supported. Say, no question about that. Now, and then he says, and they which wait on the altar are partakers with the altar. Now, what he's simply saying here is in the Old Testament, you see, the, the, the Levites, the priests in the Old Testament were supported by the tithes of God's children. Now, that's obvious what he's saying here. But then in verse 14, See, even so, now here is where you get some serious Bible teaching and you need to cover, uh, circle that word, even so, even so, even so, the Bible says in the next verse, hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And what he's saying here in the Old Testament, they were supported by tithes and offerings. Now, even so, you see, even so, they who preach the gospel today are, as he says here, should live of the gospel, which means that they should be supported literally in the context here, if you want to have some good Bible exposition, off the tithes of God's children today. See, that is what he is saying here uh, in uh, uh, this verse. So uh, we see that in the, in the New Testament, you see, the Bible commends the matter of tithing. For instance, here in this passage, as God's way to support uh, those that are preaching the gospel today, pastors and missionaries uh, uh, today. Now, um, someone might say, well, uh, I, uh, I, I today am under grace. So because I'm under grace today, that means I can give anything I want, you see, and uh, I'm under grace today. And someone say, now, I know the Old Testament teaches tithing. I know that Jesus commended to tithing, uh, but we are under grace today. Well, now, uh, my answer to that is if we want to use that logic, which is a higher standard of Christian living, the law or love in the New Testament? Say, no question about it. Say, we in the New Testament, the church age, have a much higher standard of Christian conduct than they had in the Old Testament. You know, Jesus uh, went into this in a, in a lot of detail. You have said, but he said, I say unto you. Say, and the standard of our Lord is much higher. Now, say, the answer is, which is a higher standard, law or love? Which is a higher standard, law or love? And love is a much higher standard. Say, that's the standard in uh, the New Testament. Now, you see, in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, the Bible says we ought to abound in the grace of giving. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, again, Paul is writing there to the church at Corinth. Now, and what he says to the church at Corinth uh, uh, there is that you have all these gifts in the church. And you have a, a wonderful church, especially the speaking gifts and uh, those type of things that we read about. But then he says there's an area in your life at the, at the uh, church at Corinth that you've come way behind in. And that is in the area of giving. 
And so Paul says, as you abound in these other areas, as you are gifted in these other areas, so uh, you need to abound now in the area of giving. Say, abound in that area. That's the area you ought to go overboard in. Someone says, I'm a Christian. Well, there's one area you can never go too much overboard in, and that's the matter of giving. Say, that's the matter of giving. He says you ought to abound in that uh, grace. See, and by the way, that uh, word abound is a great New Testament word, and it means go way, way, way beyond. See, uh, way beyond. See, that's abound in the area of uh, the matter of uh, uh, giving. Now, you see, we see this clearly illustrated in uh, the New Testament. No, no uh, question uh, uh, about that. Now, uh, you see that we are to abound in the area of uh, giving. Now, um, what we uh, want to look at, just a, a moment, is the Bible is clear about New Testament giving, and the Bible is clear about Old Testament giving. Now, as we uh, study the Word of God, what we want to point out very clearly is where should I do my giving according to the Bible? Now, not according to what somebody says, but the Bible. See, now, uh, again, the Old Testament teaches giving, New Testament teaches giving, but now, where should I give? Now, when you study the Old Testament, which most people don't, and most people don't have a clue of what the Old Testament is really all about. They never get a hold of the Old Testament uh, teaching because they never really study the Old Testament. And most sermons you hear and, and preach from the Old Testament are out of context. They uh, are not biblical uh, sermons or just verses that somebody takes out and applies in a devotional way or something like that. But now as you study the Old Testament, there's no question about it. There is only one place where all of the giving was done in the Old Testament. And that was the tabernacle. Then after the tabernacle, the temple was built under Solomon. And all giving, not some, all giving in the Old Testament was given to the uh, tabernacle. And then later on under uh, Solomon uh, built a, uh, the temple. Now, when you read the Old Testament, you see, like in Deuteronomy chapter 12, the Bible says that God had an ordained place. See, that uh, the tabernacle later on the temple, that was God's ordained place. Now, we all know, and everybody knows who studies the Bible, that in the Old Testament, that is where they brought their sacrifices. See, and in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 5 through 11, it says we are to bring our sacrifices to the God's ordained place, see, which was the Old Testament, uh, again, tabernacle and later on uh, uh, the temple. Now, and um, then in Leviticus chapter 17 and verses 18 and 19, there's only one place to bring their sacrifices, uh, and that was to what the Bible specifically says now was God's ordained place. The, God, the place where God ordained to give it, see, and that was um, the temple as time went on in uh, the Old Testament. Now, for instance, in the Old Testament, if someone did not bring their sacrifice to the temple and they sacrificed it on their own, uh, maybe outside their house or someplace else. The penalty of that was the Bible says they were to be cut off from the nation of Israel. See, and the Bible is very plain and, and uh, uh, very, uh, very clear that that person was to be cut off from the nation of Israel. In other words, if you tried to worship God outside of the way that God said to worship him, very clear, no question about it, as you study the Old Testament. Now, if you didn't bring that sacrifice 
to God's ordained place and you, you offered that sacrifice someplace else, the Bible says you'd be surely cut off from the nation of Israel. Now, what does that mean? That's the same terminology for the worst sins in the nation of Israel. For instance, if somebody took their baby and offered their baby as a sacrifice to a pagan god, and they did do that uh, in the Old Testament as we read about it, when they were backslidden away from God. Say that person was to be cut off from the nation of Israel. Same with homosexuals in the Old Testament. The same with heretics. But now, see, a lot of people don't study the Old Testament. But if you did not bring your sacrifice to God's ordained place, say you were to be cut off from the nation of uh, Israel. So there's no question about that as we study the Old Testament. Uh, uh, that's a given for anybody that studies the Old Testament. Now, in the Old Testament, when, whenever the people were right with God, they brought their uh, tithes to the temple. When they were not right with God, they did not bring their tithes to the temple. They didn't do it, you see. And uh, that's why whenever you study about a revival, and there weren't many, uh, but there's some under Hezekiah, Josiah. There were some revivals in the Old Testament. And the result of those revivals, as you study about them, a lot of times we preach and talk about them, but one thing we neglect, say one part of the revival in the Old Testament was that they started bringing their tithes to the Lord. They repented of their sin of robbing God, and then they started bringing their tithes uh, to uh, uh, the temple, like in uh, uh, Hezekiah's revival, 2 Chronicles 31, verses 10 through uh, uh, 12. You see, the Bible says they were bringing all their tithes to the house of God. Now, 200 times in the Old Testament, the Bible refers to the house of God. And that is talking here about the temple. Now, see, as we study the, uh, the Word of God, you see, that uh, phrase is used 200 times in the Old Testament, the house of God. That was God's ordained place to bring the tithes. And when they had the revival under Hezekiah, the Bible says they brought their tithes, uh, 2 Chronicles 31, you see, to the house of God. Now, here's another thing about understanding the Bible. You see, I would consider myself a dispensationalist, so forth, but uh, a lot of dispensationalists ignore the Old Testament, see, and they do not get the blessing God wants them to get out of the Old Testament because they say, they say the Jew has been done away with, see, and uh, now we're in the church age. But you see, under the Old Testament, there are all types of great blessing and truth. Never write off the Old Testament. Just like here, you have 200 times in the Old Testament, the house of God, the house of God. That's something we can all learn from. And that's where uh, they brought their ties as we study uh, the Word of God. There, in other words, there's no question about it. In the Old Testament, they brought their ties to the house of God. By the way, that's why we're going through the book of Judges on Sunday night. Most people, most Bible teachers have written off the book of Judges. And they say the book of Judges doesn't apply to us today. There's no blessing. But yet there's great blessing. Say every one of those judges in the book of Judges is a type of the greatest deliverer the world will ever see, and that's Jesus Christ. It's a tremendous truth when you study uh, uh, the judges, you see, uh, for us today. But a lot of people write it off. Now, I remember when Jesus was on the road to Emmaus, and um, he gave the Bible conference to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke chapter 24. Does somebody remember where the Bible says Jesus began his teaching? In Luke chapter 24, do you remember? Say, at Moses, that's where he began. The Bible, say, there's a lot in the Old Testament that is uh, revolutionary, dynamic teaching for us today 
because we really don't study the Old Testament the way we should. Of course, the New Testament says it's all given for our edification so that we might learn and edified, be edified by it. But then uh, again, now we're talking about the Old Testament. Where did they give in the Old Testament? And then the last book in the Old Testament, chronologically, uh, parallel with the book of Ezra, is that book of Malachi. And the Bible says, bring all the ties into, the Bible says, uh, into the storehouse. Now, the storehouse was a place in the temple where they stored the tithes. See, that's the storehouse in the temple. And then in uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10, the Bible says there, again, in my house. Turn to it. See, and uh, now again, this is under the Old Testament and Malachi chapter 3 and uh, verse uh, 10, you see, and he says here, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that's the temple, that there may be meat in, what does he say, mine house, my house. Don't ever forget that. There is a one single place of God ordained worship and bringing sacrifices, and that is in the, uh, the temple in the Old Testament. So there's no question about that, and there's no debate about that for anybody that studies the Bible. I mean, uh, there is no question. In my house, you see, uh, bring uh, into the storehouse. So it's clear, no question about it. Now uh, we come to the New Testament, and now we're talking about the place of our giving. See, we know where the giving was in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, the Bible is very clear. You start, uh, for instance, in Acts chapter 4 and verses 35, 37 through the beginning of Acts chapter 5. And there you have a man that was giving and uh, a man who had a giver's heart and his name, as we read the Word of God, was Barnabas. And remember, Barnabas evidently, seemingly was a wealthy man and he had a big piece, a very expensive piece of property. Now, the Bible says that he sold that property and he gave all the money to the church because the church at Jerusalem at that time needed money. 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost or uh, converts there from all over the world at the church at Jerusalem at that time. And they took, had to take care of the widows and the poor and the feeding. And so he gave all the money and the Bible says, does, does anybody remember specifically what the Bible, where he gave the money? The Bible says, at the apostles' feet. See, they were the pastors of the church at Jerusalem. And so the Bible says he brought that money and he gave it to the apostles at the apostles' feet. And then we read about two other people in the Bible. And we read about Ananias and Sapphira. Now, everybody knows the story there that... Uh, they uh, wanted to keep up with the Joneses. They wanted everybody to look upon them and, uh, and uh, let them know how much they gave. And so they evidently had a very expensive piece of property. They gave it, but they kept back part of the price. See, and that's where they lied. They said they gave it all, but they kept back part of it. And the Bible is very clear. They came, they, they gave it at the apostles' feet. So the place where the giving was, was in the church to the apostles, at the apostles' uh, feet. Now, by the way, keep in mind that that was all voluntary. No one told Barnabas to give it. No one told Ananias and Sapphira to give it. See, they did that of their own free will. See, but the, the point we're simply getting at, the place where they gave it was the church. There's no question about that in Acts chapter 4 and Acts chapter uh, uh, 5. And then uh, turn over in your Bible now to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, now this is in uh, this, the category of ecclesiology. See, what the Bible teaches about the church, what the, how to support the church in giving. Now, in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. Uh, 
2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we read here, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and, uh, um, and verse 1. See, uh, the Bible says in verse uh, chapter 8, 2 Corinthians 8, 1, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit or to know, see, the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. He didn't say individuals in Macedonia, but the churches in Macedonia. See, and he's talking here about giving and the offering uh, and so forth for the poor saints at Jerusalem. You look down in 2 Corinthians 8 and verses 19, 18 and 19, and he mentions throughout all the church is. And then the next verse he mentions the church is. See, and then in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 23 and 25, the messengers of the churches. And then he says before the churches. So you see, uh, it was a church-centered matter. See, uh, no question about that. Now, uh, turn, over, turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we read here in, uh, uh, in uh, verses 1 and 2. Now, concerning the collection for the saints, that's the poor saints at Jerusalem, as I have given order to the churches, not individuals. Say, Paul never addressed an individual in relation to giving. It's always a church matter. You see, he doesn't say, I uh, went to Mr. So-and-so because he had a lot of money. He doesn't say anything like that. See, what it says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do uh, ye. Now, see, I gave order to the churches. Now, when you read about giving in the New Testament, it is always a church-centered matter. There is no giving in the New Testament apart from the local New Testament church. It's clear as we study uh, uh, the Word of God. It was the New Testament exclusively. Like many have realized when they study the New Testament, for instance, one outstanding uh, teacher said, the apostles founded churches and they found it nothing else. The apostles founded churches and nothing else. Because for the ends in view, nothing else was required or could have been so suitable. In each place where they labored, they formed the converts into a local church. No other organization than the local church appears in the New Testament, nor do we find even the germ of anything else. Nothing else in the New Testament except the church, and the giving is in and through the church. Now, another outstanding teacher said, um, it is noticeable in the book of Acts that no attempt was made to form any organization of any kind for carrying on the work of the Lord, the local church was God's unit on the earth for pop propagating the faith, and the disciples were content, you see, to work within that context. That's the teaching about the church in the New Testament. No question about it. So, uh, as we... Uh, Study uh, the New Testament. The Bible is very, very uh, clear. See, where should we give, do our giving today? The local church is the only place the Bible tells a Christian to do their Christian giving. Now, if you want to give to some secular organization in some other way, but we're talking now about the church, see, and uh, church giving. Say, and all my giving should be done in and through the church. Now, that is the teaching of the Word of God. Nobody can debate that. Nobody can get around that. 
uh, say, well, look at all these Christian organizations in the world today. They have no biblical basis to be in operation apart from the local church. You see, uh, no question about it as you study the Bible. Now, most people don't study the Bible and they make up their own uh, uh, teaching and so forth. They don't follow the Bible. They're not in the Bible. They're not in uh, the Word of God. So the Bible is very clear that it should be done through the church, and I believe that the minimum standard of all Christian giving should be the tithe. Now, that's where we begin. That's not where we stop, but that's where we begin, and I believe that was the clear teaching of the Word of God. Now, that's not where we end, but that's where we uh, uh, begin. The Bible says we are to abound in giving. That's a great verse in the Bible. Say, this is an area that I'm to abound in. Now, if I'm to abound in giving, 2 Corinthians 8, 7, uh, that would certainly be above the tithe. Say, if we're going to abound and, and grow and develop in our giving. So, the Bible, I believe, is clear. And a Christian in the New Testament church, we go into a lot of writings of the early church fathers, that the minimum standard of giving was always the tithe. Now, again, you can go way, way back to before the law, before Moses, and Abraham, the type of a believer, gave his tithes unto Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, by the way, see, the church is the body of Christ upon earth. See, that he functions through, see, uh, the local uh, uh, church. Now, um, the amount is real clear, I believe, as we study the Bible, that it's hard for a Christian to study the Bible and have a good conscience about giving if they're not a tither. I believe they have a real problem uh, with that. So the place exclusively is the local uh, church. Now, um, someone might say, well, I am led of the Spirit where I should give and how much I should give. Now, see, the Holy Spirit never leads anybody apart from the Word of God. See, it's just like uh, if I'm saved... Do I have to pray about being baptized? Absolutely not. Why? Because I'm commanded to be baptized. You don't pray about that. Uh, what does the Bible teach? Should, uh, should uh, a saved person marry an unsaved person? The Bible is clear that that's not God's will. You see, that's con see what I'm saying, see, there are a lot of things in the Bible that we don't have to pray about. Why? Because God's already told us what to do, Amen. Say, there's certain things you don't have to pray about. Um, we're dealing on Wednesday night, and uh, should I love my neighbor? We're commanded to love our neighbors. <laughs> you don't pray about that. You may, may uh, have to pray, Lord, help me to love my neighbor, but we're commanded to love. Now, um, see, as we study the Word of God, uh, you see, usually when a person says, I let the Spirit lead me, that means they, are, they do not want to give the way God wants them to give. That's what they're really saying. Because God's already told you where to give, how much to give, and in uh, the Word of God. And He never instructs us apart from the Word of God. See, because God has given us His Word and given us instruction along this line. But now, that's just an introduction. Uh, Lord willing, we may go into this in more detail as time goes on. But that's just a a quick survey of before the law, during the law, during the ministry of Jesus, then during uh, the day and age of the church age, the local church in which we are living uh, today. And I uh, monitor some of these Christian networks in America, Christian radio stations, and they, uh, on a couple of them, they have a uh, call-in program where they have a financial advisor and all the financial advisors, I will say, on all the Christian networks that I've seen, Money Sense and all these different guys, they all are agreed with Pastor Gent, believe it or not, that the tithe belongs to the church and the place where you should give the tithe is the church. Now, I do not know of a financial advisor 
who does not believe that and teach that. Some of you heard of Dave Ramsey, the third most listened to radio program in America. Now, as far as I know, Dave Ramsey is a born again Christian. He, uh, a lot of people don't like it because a lot of times he'll go into a break and he said the only way to have peace is to know the Prince of Peace who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So I appreciate that he stands up for Jesus Christ. And uh, a lot of times people call in and now uh, he deals with unsaved people. But now if they're saved, he always says the same thing. He says, are you a tither? Do you give your tithe to the local church? That, and by the way, he's been in it for 40 years. He said, I've studied the Bible for 40 years. And so, see, he agrees with Pastor Gent. I agree with him in that matter. Now, I'm not saying I agree with everything they teach and so forth, but uh, they all say that the tithe belongs to the church and you should give your tithe to the church. But anyway, uh, I just listened to it for about five minutes and one of these uh, uh, people called in, uh, called, uh, it's called Money Sense, and the fellow is, a, I believe, a real good Christian who is his financial advisor. And a woman said that, I live in the state of Maine and uh, I inherited $90,000. And she said, I'm a member of a small church. We meet in a home and then we meet in a school. And uh, <clears throat> she said, my question is, and by the way, this is why I know everybody here this morning is interested in knowing what the Bible teaches about this subject. It's a very popular subject. In the call-in programs, most everybody wants to know how much should I give and where should I give. Christian people want to know Bible. Uh, the churches haven't taught this. See, hardly anybody teaches anything about this. And she said, uh, my tithe would be $9,000. She said, I think that's a lot of money to give to my church. And uh, she said, what do you think? And he said, the tithe belongs to the church. He said, you ought to give that $9,000 to your local church. By the way, uh, do we have any concern for the church and the building churches in America? Here's a small struggling church. A woman comes into some money, and then she is reluctant to give a tithe. Now, the only thing is that's just 10%. She had the 90% left over. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, this, the people just don't look at it in, in a same way. But now, um, get a little deeper into this. There's one seminary that I know that teaches biblical giving. I'm not, uh, I don't know of a Bible school that does. I don't know of any other school, but I know this school does. Unless they changed in the last six months. But uh, so they have their students, and they want to teach their students biblical giving. And they have a burden about that. So when you come out of that school, you will know what the Bible teaches about giving, and that you will preach this in a biblical way, not in, you know, these crazy ways that a lot of people uh, are preaching giving today that's totally unscriptural. So they had a businessman come who has devoted the rest of his life to encourage Christians in their giving. And um, he retired recently, and now the rest of his life, he, he just spends in encouraging Christians to give biblically and encourage uh, churches in this matter. And this is not for the glory of man or anything like that. See, this is in relation to having a burden for ministerial students who need to know what the Bible teaches about giving. And I heard uh, his message to those students. And he said, he said, I am from Arkansas. And he said, I sold my business, I guess it was a year ago at this time. And he said, I sold my business for $23 million. He said the next Sunday, and he's not glorifying himself, that's why no names would be even given about this, but uh, he said then the next Sunday, I put a check in my church for $2,300,000.
Now, he said, people would say, you know, and the first reaction is, that's too much money. See, why did you do such a thing? Now, he said, the reason why I did it is because that's what the Bible teaches I should do. See, I made that profit off my business, whatever it was. And so he said, the $2,300,000 was my tithe. And he says, after I got saved, he said, in that uh, church I was in, it was a Baptist church, they taught tithing, and the people were tithing. And he says, all my Christian life, he said, I tithed. He said, everything that came my way. He said, I'd give 10% to the Lord. He said, I didn't think twice about it. And so he said, when I came to that point, where I sold my business for $23 million, said I had no conscience at all about putting that check in the mail uh, or in the, the offering of the local church. Now, see, he did that, and he's trying to teach students about biblical uh, giving, you see, and why they ought to give to the church. Uh, minimum standard is the, uh, uh, is, uh, the tithe. Now, um, you see, and he said, I had all the confidence in the world that the spiritual men of that church would make sure that that money was given and be used for the glory of God. So that's because they were spiritual men and a spiritual pastor. They're not going to go out and, and uh, live, up, uh, live it up. They're going to use it for the glory of God. See, that's the local church. The spiritual men of the church would make that decision. He said, I didn't uh, make the decision. I would not be on the decision. Uh, committee uh, to uh, find, uh, you know, to see where that uh, 2300000 is going. Now, see, a lot of times that gets us to understand a principle. See, a lot of times people think they can give too much. Nobody can give too much. Now, see, here's a, a principle in the Word of God. What was the sin of Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? You all know, everybody knows the story. What was their sin in Acts chapter 5? They lied. Okay, what did they lie about? They lied specifically about the amount of money that they gave. See, the Bible is real clear. God gave Peter the uh, wisdom of the Holy Spirit to say, say, but you kept back part of the price, but you said you gave it all. You said you gave it all. That was a lie. And in Acts chapter 5, the Bible says they lied to the Holy Spirit. And you know what happened. God judged them on the spot there in Acts chapter, uh, uh, Acts chapter 5. But now, see, they lied to God. That's what the Bible says. They, they lied to God. Now, why did they lie to God? I'm sure it was a very expensive piece of property. I'm sure it was a lot of money, and they were doing it in the flesh to keep up with um, Barnabas. You see, that's why they did it. But now, see, this is too much. See, their thought was, this is too much money to give to the church. Let's hold back, you see, and keep uh, a good chunk of that money for ourselves, and then we'll say we gave it all, and that's where they lied. Now, you uh, go back to this fella. <laughs> he put a check in the offering for two million three hundred thousand dollars. How much money did he have left over? You see what we're getting at? What we forget? See, you tied. You have ninety percent left over. It's not that it's going to make you poor. You think that man went into poor house? Not at all. He was a wealthy man. He was a, a, a very uh, wealthy man. Now, you give 10%, you have 90% for yourself. When you even tithe, you still have 90% uh, left over. Well, much could be said about that. Now, now we want to illustrate this so uh, we get a hold of the matter of giving. Biblical giving, Bible-based giving, not what you hear on the radio, not what you hear on television, but what the Bible says about giving. Now, suppose, and I do not own any houses, and I don't own any stocks, so when a stock market goes up and down, it never affects me. 
I have nothing in the stock market. I don't own any houses. Now, but suppose I was in the business of flipping houses. Suppose I bought a house for $100,000. And then I fixed up the house and I, pay, uh, I spent $100,000 to fix up the house. That would mean that uh, I have $200,000 in the house. And then I would sell the house for $400,000. What would be my profit? Somebody tell me. My profit would be how much? $200,000. That would be my profit, amen? After all my expenses and all the legal fees, everything, sell that. Okay, now, what portion of that $200,000 belong to God? Now, I made $200,000. What portion belongs to God? How much? The, the, the tithes would be how much? $20,000. Now, that $20,000 is not my money. That's God's money. Now, remember what we began with. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, but unto God the things that are God's. Okay, so now my tithes would be $20,000. And uh, how much would I have left over? $180,000. Am I going to go in the poor house? Absolutely not. See, you've got, you, you got $180,000 uh, uh, left over. Now, I want to illustrate this because I want to really get, get us to get a biblical meaning. Now, I want all the children to come and stand up here. All the children, all the children, I want you to come. Anybody who'd consider yourself a child, you come. And uh, all the children, all the children, anybody out in the hallway, anybody in the back, I want all the children to come. Now, what I have here is a bundle. I have 10 $1 bills. And I'm going to give that to everybody. Okay. Any, any children out in the lobby? So now you got 10 $1 bills. You got 10 $1 bills. Any other children here? Anybody need $10? Uh, if you need $10, you come. You come too. Come on if you need. Okay, now the children can be seated. Now, um, let me ask the children a question. What are you going to do with that $10? Okay, you're going to save it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with saving money. In fact, one preacher said, save all the money you can. There's nothing wrong. Okay, somebody else tell me what you're going to do with that $10. So, uh, what are you going to do with $10? What are you going to do? Well, by, by looking at him, I know what he's going to do with it. He's going to go to McDonald's. So uh, he's going to uh, tell the, uh, he's going to uh, buy the McDon uh, McDonald's for everybody, the family. But how about over here? What, what are you going to do with it? You're going to buy a, a what? Okay, Dunkin' Donuts. Okay. Now, by the way, there's, an, okay. What are you going to do? Oh, give it to the pastor. No, that's, uh, that's. Uh, you're just trying to butter me up. That's what you're trying to do. But um, you, want an, you want one of these, another $10. But, but now, anyway, here's the thing I'm getting at. Everything they said, there's nothing wrong with it. Dunkin' Donuts, McDonald's, buying a toy, saving it. But let me ask the children. What part of that money belongs to God? See, what part of your money now? You have 10 $1 bills. How much, or what part or portion of that money belongs to God? $1? Yeah, amen. See, $1 is a tithe. You see? See, you get $10. You give the tithe as a dollar. Now, the thing is, see, you got $9 left over. See? But you give your tithe. Now, um, 
I just want to illustrate uh, that, that point. See, there's nothing wrong with those things that they said. As long as the children realize one out of ten, a tithe belongs to God and should be given to God. You see, that's the, uh, the, the teaching uh, of the, the Bible. Now, you see, why should we tithe? See, and uh, okay, and uh, see, why should we tithe? Now, now the, the main reason why everybody teaches you should tithe on radio, television, and in our churches, in Bible-believing churches, is to get rich. Amen? That's why I tell you, you tithe and God will bless you and honor you if you tithe. That's not the reason. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. See, the Bible uh, never teaches that. See, if that's the reason why we would give, that's a very secular reason. I give to get, that's the world's philosophy. That's not Bible. See, in uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, God says he loves a cheerful giver. And we're not to give grudgingly nor of necessity. Now, the word grudging comes from two words, the word out of and the word sorrow. Don't, don't give, uh, and you're, but I gave and I'm sorry I gave it. No. You see, we're not to give grudgingly or necessity. But now, here's the important thing. God loves a cheerful giver. Did you get a hold of that? But if somebody says, well, God loves everybody. That's true. God does love everybody. But the Bible says, 2 Corinthians 9, 7, he loves a cheerful giver. See, that's the person that he loves. Obviously, the only way you interpret that, he loves that person in a special way. See, he loves a cheerful giver. Now, that's the attitude in which God wants us to give. Don't give grudgingly. Don't give of necessity because you have to. might illustrate this way. Uh, the, the mother tells her child to do something, uh, do some chore, whatever. And the child says, sure, mom, I'll be glad to do it. That's a blessing, amen? That's a testimony. And they say, boy, I'll be glad to do what you tell me to do, mom. Now, suppose the child says, oh, do I have to do it again? You, you make me do it all the time. Say, the way we ought to be is like the child. Sure, mom, I'll be glad to do what you tell me to do. So now, you see, the reason why we ought to give is not to get, you see, but because it pleases God. That's the teaching in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It pleases God Almighty. You see, God loveth a cheerful giver. God's love in a special way is upon that person. And then we ought to give to lay up treasure in heaven. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. In other words, he says, not down here upon earth, because everything on earth is going to be done away with, no matter what, what it is, all your wealth and whatever it might be. It's all going to be done away with someday. And then in that same passage, that's the passage in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 and following, where he ends up by saying, you cannot love God and money. You cannot love God and your money. So Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. See, another reason why we ought to give biblically is because you get a reward in heaven. Anybody can get that reward in heaven. You see, we lay up treasures in heaven. You see, we will get a reward in heaven for our giving down here because it uh, reveals to you and I, you see, and to God that our heart is with God. Our heart is in the kingdom of God. Our heart is in the program of God. 
I heard about a man, and all I'd say is, bless his heart. Every time they'd pass the offering plate or he'd go by the offering uh, plate, he would say, praise God. Every time the offering plate comes, hallelujah. And somebody in the church said to him one time after service, they said, why do you get so happy during the offering? I mean, you distract people. Uh, you go by that offering plate and you say, hallelujah. You go by the offering plate and you say, praise the Lord. And uh, the man, he was an older man. He said, I'm getting older now. He said, I'll be in heaven pretty soon. And he said, I'm just laying up treasure in heaven. So he says, every time, he said, the main attraction for me to go to church is to give so that I can lay up treasure in heaven. What a blessing, amen? What, what a wonderful person uh, somebody li like that would be. They love to give because they want to lay up those treasures, you see, uh, uh, in heaven. And he said, I know I'll be in heaven pretty soon. And so that's why he said, that's the most exciting time of the, uh, of the service for me is the giving. When I give, that's when I can uh, shout hallelujah, praise God. And, uh, but that's the attitude we all ought to get, have, Amen. You say, now there's a lot of practical things here. Have you sold a house recently? How much money did you make off the sale of your house? How much money of that sale in relation to your profit was God's money? Was God's money? Did you give it to God? So you can rob from God. You see? Or... Uh, Say, every time we get our paycheck, we ought to tithe. That doesn't mean if I'm not here, I don't have to tithe. Say, every time I get a paycheck, we ought to tithe. And, uh, but thank God for many people in the Garden State Baptist Church who would say amen to everything I'm preaching about. That you would say, thank God. I, by the grace of God, with God's help, I give in a biblical way, and uh, God is taking care of me. I don't, uh, I don't have to worry God has been so good to me, and, uh, and so I, whether I'm the poorest person or the richest person, say, I thank God that I'm giving in a biblical way. But now, if you are not giving in a biblical way, you need to search your heart. Because if you're not giving in a biblical way, you're robbing from God. Or as Jesus said, there in Matthew 22, render unto God the things that belong to God. Part of that money, Jesus said, belongs to God. Well, I trust that God will speak to our hearts and that uh, he'll help us. And uh, we're trying to get a biblical perspective on biblical giving, what the Bible talks about giving, where to give and what to give and so forth. I trust that God will speak to our hearts.